Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I got a lot of work to do today, so let me get the intro out of the way. Good morning. So happy that you're here. Today we're week two in our series. We're, we're calling Foundations. We're talking about the the essential truths of, of our faith. And we, we talked about this last week, but I think all of us feel the confusion, the weight, the kind of what the heck is going on in our, our world. And I think our country, our nation, our politics, the pandemic, social media, it, it, is, it is really, I mean, a lot of people are already talking about it. And of course, we talked about this last Sunday that people are saying we live in a post truth society. The idea that, that truth is objective, our culture just goes, no thank you. Uh, that everything is, is subjective. And so I think a, a lot of people, a lot of people of faith, I think in particular, the last year or so, uh, we talked a lot about this last Sunday, they're, they're, they're deconstructing. They're kind of kicking the tires of what they were raised with, what they have believed for a long time. And so that's what the, this series is hopefully set up to kind of help you rebuild. Uh, if you're going to deconstruct, I think that's very good. I think that's very healthy, but make sure you also reconstruct, that you find something to hold on to, to, like Christina just said, to anchor ourselves to. And we, too, we laughed about um, last week that, that kind of social media has given everyone a platform, everyone a voice, and, and sometimes things just go viral and become popular that just simply aren't true. And I, I already shared this, but I'll say it again because I'm still mad about it. There was this, this video on TikTok that had like 2 million views and 100 thousand plus comments and, and, and the person on the video was was basically like if you believe the Bible is nonsense I can't believe you would think that the Bible is trustworthy every single one of Jesus's disciples were illiterate they could not read they could not write so why would you think that they wrote the Bible and we joked and smirked and some of you look confused and that's why I'm doing this series um, that's not true like that's a simple Google like they were all literate. They all could read. They were all Jewish men. They were raised in school, even if they went to do their trade, right, the fishermen. But then we also have people that were like doctors and members of the Sanhedrin and tax collectors, like the opposite, like the very much opposite is true. They were very well educated, not illiterate, but we talked about that, you know, in those comments, people were like, yep, 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 that's why, that's why, that's why, and I'm sorry, that's what angered me. I went like, man, there's just this world. It's just because somebody can talk eloquently, we just take it all at face value, and I know, it's a little ironic, says the dude on stage holding a microphone. So that, that, that's my heart, that we're going to kind of go through the legacy of our doctrine. It's not just, here are my ideas on things, but no, these are thousands and thousands of tried and tested. We talked about this a lot last week, that generation after generation have wrestled with the, these big concepts of faith and of God and of Christ and of what does it mean to be human, what does it mean to follow Jesus. And, and now just in this generation, it's, it's just our turn. It's, it's our turn to wrestle, to think, to dive into truth, so hopefully, by God's grace, the, the church of legacy, right, continues on past the pandemic, past this generation, because really, it's just, it's just our chance, our turn, our time to run the race that's been marked out for us. So, so last week, all we did was read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and we kind of set our course. We talked about some very key things that we see just in the beginning of the Bible. Really, to summarize it, what we saw was doctrine, dogma, and deception. We talked about this last week, that, that what, what my heart for you is that, is that you can understand the truths of God, the, the, the essential doctrines. We, we talked about how Everyone is a theologian, not just me, not just the people that went to school. Everyone's a theologian because if you've had thoughts about God, if you have words, because theologian just literally means words about God. So if you've ever had words about God, then you're, you're, you're a theologian. And so what we want to do is we want to embrace the truth about God, the truth about Christ, the truth about the Bible, the truth about scriptures, because I believe that, that correctly understanding God is kind of like an antibiotic for your soul, for your mind, for your life. That if you can let that work its way through when trials come your way, when setbacks come your way, you don't just go, I don't know, what do I think about this? But you go, this is what my God has said about me, about this world, and about my hope in Him. And then also we talk about how kind of bad theology sometimes can be like a cancer. And I think that's a little bit of, of, of the dogma. So for, for our purposes, we said that dogma is basically just kind of church rules that sometimes are passed down from generation to generation that aren't really anywhere in the Bible, but we just kind of hold on to it, and we exclude people, and we think culturally so-and-so is better than us, or these people aren't as worthy of us, and every generation kind of got their nonsense that they got to kind of kick around and, and, and deal 
deal with. And remember last week we talked about the Imago Dei, that every single person, every single human being is made in the image and likeness of God, that they are literally statues, monuments to the glory of God. God gave that to every single one of us, and we smiled that hopefully that would change the way we drive, the way we talk, the way we deal with, with the people in our community, in our jobs, in our family that sometimes rub us the wrong way, right? Hypothetically, of course, but we reminded ourselves that all of us have been given infinite value and worth, not by your occupation or your salary or your education, but it was innately, divinely given to you by God in the image and likeness of God. God made us. And then so lastly, we talked about deception. Obviously, we read in Genesis 3, Satan taking the form of a serpent did to Adam and Eve what he does to us every single day. Did God really say? Is that really true? To make you begin to question uh, core truths about the God that loves you and made you and calls you today, did God really say? And again, they disobeyed. The one thing, this, 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 uh, this tree in the garden, I think for Adam and Eve, God, God made the tree to instill um, rule and trust so that they would know that God is in charge, that He is infinitely ranked higher than them, and he, they were with them in the garden, but He's like, I, I'm going to trust you here. All of this is yours, but don't touch that. But again, the deception won that day. And we talked about the gospel in the garden last week, that, that God said, hey, if you eat this tree, you're going to die. But did they die? No. His grace even then extended to Adam and Eve. They, they didn't die, even though he said that they would. Surely you will die, he said. But no, his grace even covered their sin. And then if you remember, he talked to uh, the serpent and to Eve, and he promised a son from Eve that would crush the head of the serpent. We talked about that all of theology, the purpose of all of it is not so that you can check off the correct, you know, multiple choice questions for some theological test. No, it's that you would experience in a brand new way, the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. The, the purpose, the, the end of all doctrine and theology is not just, I learned something today, but no, I experience God in a brand new way. And that's my heart throughout this series. I told you I have a lot to do. I do. We have 46 slides. So today we are climbing Mount Everest as a church. I'm very excited. So today what I want to talk to you about is basically just two sermons in one, and I hope you can stay with me. And if you're outside, hello, outside church, I haven't greeted you yet. Online church as well. Who is, I was up in the sound booth during worship, so I know we got Brianna Moore watching, Tina Hasty watching. That's all I remember right now. Sorry, but thank you so much for watching online. So today again, two sermons in one. I'm going to talk to you about the existence of God and then the attributes of God found in Scripture. Now, there's a bit of a presupposition here today because I'm going to be talking a lot about the Bible. And maybe you're like, I don't trust the Bible. The Bible is just a weird book club. All of this is just super strange. Again, like I said last week, stay with me. We're going to talk about the Bible. We're going to talk about the trustworthiness, the divine inspiration of the inerrancy of Scripture. But if you'll let me have today, if that's where you're at, if you'll let me have today, I want to talk to you about how the Bible talks about the God of the universe, and then I'm going to give three philosophical arguments for the existence of God that I believe these in particular, this isn't like an exhaustive list, but I think these three really do find their home in Scripture. So again, long sermon, sticking close to my notes. The more you amen, like it's like 2x in the podcast. Okay, I'll go faster and faster the more I feel like you're paying attention. Well, I'll have a great lunch and say, praise the Lord, I learned something and experienced something new today. Are you ready? They sound half ready. That's cool. All right, so let me show you our, our, um, our verse is kind of our, our anchor throughout the series. This is Romans 10. Sorry, Chad, I'm already out of order and I've barely begun. Uh, Romans 10, 17, and then we will go ahead and dive in. I want to say this again. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. We want that antibiotic for our soul. We're going to embrace what? Not just doctrine, not just this is what the assemblies have got. No, it, it's we want to embrace Christ and the words that come from him through the word of God. So again, today is all about the existence and the attributes of God. Let's go. First thing, again, I'm going to talk to you about three philosophical arguments for the existence of God. I got scripture to back them up, but again, these are not my thoughts. These are not even my words. This is the word of really uh, Plato, Socrates, um, da uh, Dr. William Craig, kind of more contemporary guy, uh, Soren Kierkegaard, who I, I have a nephew now named after Soren. Lauren Kierkegaard, what up? Hannah and Robert, they're not watching, but I'll wave to them nonetheless. So these are philosophers. Over thousands of years, they have said, you know what, this is why I believe in God. 
So again, I want to share these three with, with you. The first one is called the cosmological argument. I should have said this from the beginning. Can you do yourself and maybe me a favor? Grab your phone, grab something to take notes today. I will say for the very first time ever, my full sermon notes are on the, the, the video stream uh, description today, like you can see. And it's weird. Uh, guys, I got to let you know, I highlight stuff. I color code stuff. You'll be like, my pastor is a crazy person but he does take the preaching of God's word seriously. So you'll see what I'm reading today for the first time. That felt a little weird, but I was like, you know what, there's too much content. So you guys could even open that up right now, see a 10 second delayed version of me and just follow along in the description. So the cosmological argument, which is called um, the argument of first cause. This argument asserts that for every effect, there must be a cause. Therefore, the material world that we live in must have a beginning. And that beginning must be outside of the material world that we live in. Again, everything we experience, everything we know in this earth, it, it, it has a cause. Uh, your birth, this church, uh, even your attendance in church today, like it wasn't just randomness plus time. No, you made the decision. I will be the cause for my church attendance today. Everything we experience, that it has a, a definite Cause. Again, cause is intuitive to the world in which we live. So when we think about the universe, when we think about big things like the existence of God, uh, it, it's a logical scientific question to, for all of us to ask, where did this all come from? Where did the universe come from? Where did this world come from? Where did you and I come from? And again, that's where the cosmological argument really shines. So if that was nerdy, Buckle in, this is going to get even nerdier. Albert Einstein. We all know Albert Einstein. He's a personal friend of mine. No, but we all, we all, we all heard of Einstein, right? Theory of relativity. That gave us, for the very first time, we were able to speak scientifically and meaningfully about the existence and the cause of our universe. Now then, there was Dr. Feynman that shortly after that, using his theory of relativity, he showed, proved rather, that our universe was constantly expanding, right? We know this, that, that, that our universe is constantly continuing continually uh, expanding. Then Dr. Hubble, a few years later, him of telescope fame, uh, he, he saw red shifts in, our, in, in the outer atmosphere of our galaxy and from there was able to prove that not only is our universe constantly expanding, but it also originated from one finite place. Okay, are you still with me? So Albert Einstein, smart dude, then a couple other smart people after him realized that not only is our universe expanding, but it began at one finite point. Nod, are you with me? Are you with me? So this is a big scientific problem because of what they call the time-space-matter continuum. Don't worry, I'll explain that. Scientists still are like, we don't really know how our universe came to be because the, the cause of our universe must be able to exist outside of those three things which are very important finite laws, or not, not finite, um, uh, uh, certain laws of our universe. We need time, we need space, and we need matter. And the cause of our universe must be able to live outside of those things. I'll explain it to you in really simple terms. You can't exist, the universe can't create without these three coming to existence simultaneously. Because if you had matter plus time but no space, then, then where would you put our universe? And if you had matter plus space but no time, then when would you put our universe? And of course, space plus time but no matter, then there's, there's no universe to put, right? So this means, again, that our universe cannot cause or create itself. Its cause stay with me, must be beyond space, beyond time, and beyond our material universe. This cause, again, must be spaceless, timeless, immaterial, uncaused, and infinitely powerful. And science today goes, we don't know what, and I assert we know who. It's God. Yeah, amen, it's a clap for the moment. So here's something that always makes me smile, and we did go through this verse last Sunday, but it's always just made me smirk and smile. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We know this. But I think right here, again, we, we talked last week, the purpose of Genesis is not a scientific book, it's a, it's, it's a book rich in theology, but I don't know if you see it yet, but it's all right there. Time, space, and matter. In the beginning, there's our time. God created the heavens, there's the space, and the earth, there's matter. Again, the axiological, sorry, the, rather the cosmological argument is that we don't know where the universe came from. And I think 34,000 years ago, we got the answer right here. God created everything. 
So let me show you what Romans, yeah, feel free. <laughs> Are we allowed to clap in church? I don't know. Just to listen. Listen, if you think about it, just do it. Okay, let your hands be faster than your brain. Let your heart and your hands connect. Yeah, that's good. I don't think you're ever going to clap in church and be like, oh, that was a, that was a mistake. <laughs> I don't think he wanted us to be that excited about Jesus, right? <laughs> you know? So Romans 1.20 proves this to us, the cosmological argument. It says this, for his invisible attributes, hear this, Namely, His eternal power and His divine nature have clearly been perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. Now, maybe you're here and you're thinking, you really believe in an invisible, um, un... What's... I, sorry, it's in my notes. <laughs> Unobservable God. A lot of people are... Or a lot of people just like, I, I don't understand that you would believe in a, a being, a deity that is invisible and cannot be observed. So, let me just geek out a little more, they'll move on to point number two, and I got a whole lot more sermon to hit with you. It's interesting, I think, in the scientific community right now, there's a lot of talk about the fascination of multiverse theory, about string theory, right? Which is fascinating. Again, this is not an anti-science sermon ever, 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 ever. But I think it's very interesting that within the scientific community, you can go on YouTube, Neil deGrasse Tyson just nerds out on this all day, the idea that we exist in only one plane of universes, but there are infinite invisible, unobservable uh, universes. So, so maybe this will make sense, and if not, it's okay, I got more sermon. Uh, I think it's very interesting that the scientific community is perfectly fine with an invisible and unobservable universe, but they're not okay with an invisible, unobservable God. So, so I think it's very interesting that they're, like, they're okay with things being invisible, they're okay with things being unobservable, they just don't want God to be a part of that. So again, just something to chew on, something to think about. Point number two of part one of this sermon <laughs> is the teleological argument. This is the argument of design. Now again, scientific nerds in the room, I'm one of them. This is not an anti-science sermon at all. Stay with me, because so many times when we talk about the argument of design, there are pastors and there are Christians that want the Bible to say things about science that it does not. Again, I believe science finds its proper home in Christianity. So, the teleological argument. This argument seeks to convince us through the amazing harmony in creation that the world has been ordered by a designer that is God. Again, this is not why science is wrong. I don't think science is wrong. I think science is a signpost he pointing heavenward back to Jesus Christ. So this is also can be known as, as an argument by analogy, which is basically situation A tells us something about situation B. The most classic example of the teleological argument is the watch. If you found a watch in the middle of the forest, you wouldn't go, wow, that's crazy that all these pieces just happened over time to make this watch for me. No, you you'd see the watch and you'd go, okay, I get it. Somebody made that watch, right? If you had coffee this morning and if you didn't repent in the name of the Lord and drink caffeine before coming to church, <laughs> you wouldn't go, how weird that there were beans that were raised and then somehow made it into my kitchen and then ground themselves up and then hot water poured through them and now it's in my cup. No, you wouldn't do that. You would say, I got a coffee maker. Maybe you have one, you push a button. That's the, that's the holiest way to have coffee. It's ready for you at four in the morning. Praise the Lord. But you know, okay, watch, watch maker, coffee, coffee maker. So, so with everything we see in the world, in our universe, it just begs to go, okay, who made this? This is very interesting, right? So watch, watch maker, coffee, coffee maker, world, world maker. So let, let's talk. And, and again, I, I wish I was smarter. I would, this sermon would be so much better. But let me just talk to you a little bit about our universe, just to remind you so that you hopefully can just go, dang, okay? So our earth weighs about six billion trillion tons. Hello and is moving around the sun at roughly 66,000 miles per hour, and is doing that while perfectly rotating at the equator a little over 1,000 miles an hour. So when you wake up and you feel like your head is spinning, it is. And what I think is, is so interesting is that all of that, like if you can picture all of that like finely tuned knobs in our universe, like if you mess with one of them, it's all gone. Like all of that right there, if you move it by a fraction of a percentage of a micromillimeter, we don't have existence. We don't have our universe, but it's all right there. The solar system that we live in, which fills less than a trillionth of the available space in the known universe, is moving at 558,000 miles per hour, and we're part of the Milky Way galaxy. You know that with the candy bar is not very good, but the universe is. Am I randomly throwing shade at candy? Yes, I am. And it takes our solar system between 200 and 250 million years just to orbit 
that Milky Way galaxy once. And again, our galaxy is just one of 100 billion known galaxies. So that's big. Let's get microscopic, y'all. Your body is made up of around 75 trillion cells, every one of those cells containing hundreds and thousands of molecules with six feet of DNA and every cell containing over three billion letters of coding. These cells are a potent blend of matter and memory. It's bones and hair and blood and teeth and personality and emotions and habits and the lyrics to the Men Without Hat song. You can dance if you want to. You can leave your friends behind because your friends don't dance. And if they don't dance, they ain't no friends of mine. I see. You can go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> you. It's all you constantly radiating at 98.6 degrees, giving up 100 watts of energy in your surroundings, con containing 7 times 10 to the 18th power of potential energy that's the equivalent of 30 hydrogen bombs. Be nice to the person you're sitting next to. So Psalm 19 says it this way, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day it pours out speech, and night to night it reveals knowledge. There is no speech, no, there is no words that voice is not heard. It's saying, listen, all of creation, all of this universe, all that we experience, it's proclaiming truth, and please don't miss the message, friends. The next time you sit and you have a great meal, the next time you listen to a song and it tugs at your heartstrings and you're like, how can a melody do that to me? The next time you laugh until you start coughing because you just laughed so much. The next time you learn something new and you feel that little, that little like joy explosion in your brain of like, whoa, that's, that's really cool. I, I hope we all believe. Gosh, there's more going on here. There's more going on here. The, here, here here's, a, here's a thing. Again, it's in the notes, but this is, this is a huge thing that, that just I always go back to. Mindless, purposeless, emotionless randomness could never create the beauties of our universe. All that we see, all that we, it, it proclaims truth. There's more going on. Again, it, to me, it proclaims the truth about God. The heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, third point in part one of my message is the, now the axiological argument. This is known as the argument of morality. It says this, and I think this in particular in kind of culturally where we're at right now as a nation, I think this particularly rings true. This argument contends that every person, regardless of their culture, has an innate sense of right and wrong. And if God is the embodiment of goodness, the embodiment of these truths, then he is the source of those objective moral values. I think another way to put it is this, where does morality come from? Where does it come from? Stay here with me, because if we're merely just matter and randomness over time, why have any compassion on anyone? Why help the needy? Shouldn't we let them just die off so there's more resources for you and me? Or, or moreover, the pain that you've experienced, that you and I have experienced when people wrong us, when people hurt us, how is that justified? How is the pain that you feel while someone's betrayed you, while someone's hurt you, how is that any, uh, how is there a molecular difference between someone loving you or blessing you? Why, why would that matter? Why is there, especially in our culture right now, this innate sense of justice, that there are people in power that deserve to be judged, and all of us are saying yes and amen. Those men, those people, those people in power need to be held accountable. They've been corrupted. They've abused people. They've taken advantage of people. They've sexually assaulted people. And all of us culturally are saying innately, that's wrong, and they need to be judged. And I would say yes and amen, but where does that morality come from? Where is that sense of right and wrong? Why do we care? Why, when we see atrocities, even when they're so far removed from us, we'll read about something overseas, we'll read about something in Afghanistan, and we get filled with anger and rage, and we think something must be done. This wrong must be made right. Where does that come from? Because, again, strictly talking without a God that has given us the Imago Dei, a God that has given us an innate sense of morality, you cannot say there is anything wrong wrong with what anyone does. Because again, it's just random. Who cares? They died. Oh well, more stuff for us. But again, you're like, don't say that, Pastor. That's weird. Because you know, 
Because you and I know, again, by what standard can you say right and wrong is right and wrong? By what standard can you say that the pain or or the shame or even just that hurt of your heart's been broken? How can you say, like, what? There's no chemical difference. Snap out of it. No, we all know. We all know there is something. Compassion matters. And love is one of the most powerful forces in our universe. Why? Because God is love. Romans 2 says it to us this way. I hope this, this proves it. It says this, they show, talking about everyone in the world, they show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness to it. And their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Again, I think we all have this this passion for justice, for things that are being done in darkness, being brought to the light. One, you're just quoting scripture at that point, right? I don't know if you know it, but all of our cultural understanding of light, we must deal with the brokenness. I would say all of that passion not only is innately given by a God who made you and loved you, but I would say all of that passion is found in Christianity, is found in the God of the Bible, the law giver who put it on our hearts. You have a conscience. It's not Jiminy Cricket. It's the Holy Spirit, right? That was so lame. I apologize for that joke. This is not okay. I'm better than that. You're better than that. So, okay, in conclusion of part one of this message, God exists. He is the all-powerful cause of the universe. He's the intelligent designer of all life, and he is the moral good of all humanity. Give yourself a round of applause. You made it through part one. Okay, so now part two. So now I want to talk to you about this God. I want to show you that what Scripture defines this God of the universe to be. And I think this is very unique. And again, uh, this, this, this whole series, kind of, you really need all of the parts for it all to work together. But I want to talk to you about the attributes of God. And I want you to know that this God, this God loves you, this God knows you, because there are other understandings, other faiths that would say that, you know, God is essentially an absentee landlord. Like, he did it, and then he's like, peace out, you figure it out. But the, the, the God of the Bible, for me, the God of the universe, is one that speaks the one that talks, the one that, that is a self-disclosing God through his word. So again, I want to talk to you about the godness of God, if you will. And I want to talk to you about two big words, the incommunicable and the communicable ac- attributes of God. So one, or these are attributes of God that you can't have. They're all his. You don't get to strive even. You just plead that he'll be that for you. And then there's also communicable attributes of God. These are attributes of God that he wants us to strive to be. Things like goodness and wisdom and mercy. So I want you to know that if you have a passion to be a good person, I hope all of us have it. You're like, I want to be evil, right? No, I think we all want to be a good person but good person. So again, true goodness is found in God. So let me talk to you about this God. Again, the first one are the attributes of God that belong to God alone. They are not yours. They are his. And the first one, you have to start here. The first one is the holiness of God. Out of all the attributes attributed to God in Scripture, holiness is mentioned more than any other attribute of God. This is the set apartness of God, the, the, the brilliance of God, the holiness of God is the perfection of God's character. And again, for every single one of these, I have scripture references. I'm going to read one of them to you, but if you're like, no, I want them all, again, the notes are on the video description. The holiness of God is so important. Again, this is, this is different than, than Eastern understandings of God, that, that God is both yin and yang, right? That God is both good and evil. The God of the Bible is a holy God. He has a perfect character. And I would say a God that is holy is the only God worth worshiping and following. Like if he could trick you, if he could deceive you, if he could go, ha ha ha, you fell for it, you stinker, and then just do evil to you, that's not a God. That's that's a demon. And so in this, again, the holiness of God is so important. Isaiah 6, 3 says this, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. The second attribute of God, again, this is one that God belongs to God alone, is that he is immutable, which means that you cannot mute him. No, it means this, sorry, that God's nature does not change. God does not wake up in a bad mood. <laughs> Praise his name, right? God doesn't wake up and be like, you know, I've just had enough of you today. I just need to, I just need to kind of take a day. Kind of I just need some me time. No, he doesn't, he doesn't change. The, the, the truth of Jesus Christ doesn't expire. It's not like, no, that's just for them. You guys are out of luck, right? The coupon doesn't go bad. 
He's immutable. God's nature does not change. Psalm 90 verse 2 says this, before the mountains were born and you brought forth the whole world, you are from everlasting to everlasting to everlasting, you are God. I love that. Before everything, there was just God, and God will always be who he says he is. He does not change. The next one is that God is infinite. God is without measure. He is without limit. He is without scope. There is not a yardstick big enough to somehow quantify his glory, right? Isaiah 40, 28 says this, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary and his understanding no one can fathom. The next one is that God is omnipotent. This means that he is all powerful. God is capable of doing anything and everything that he desires, which is important, right? Could you imagine going to God and asking for something, he's just like, man, that's out of my jurisdiction. I don't know. That's just a little too, that's a little too, I'm going to have to ask my boss, you know, right? No, he's just, no, he's all powerful. He can do whatever he desires. Isaiah 46, 10 says this, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. And I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. We serve an all powerful God. Next one, kind of diving more into the omnis, the omnipresent God is in all places, all dimensions, simultaneously. I hope this turns your brain into Vienna sausage water, just thinking, thinking about this, right? That God's right here, and he's at ABC, and he's at Father's house, and he's at Refuge, and he's in Afghanistan, and he's on the most distant star that already died because, you know, when you see us, yeah, you know, you understand. If you're like, what? Just Google it, okay? I'm not smart enough to explain that one to you. He's over there, the farthest reaching, the, the, the place where our, our, our universe is still expanding. Like, he's way past that. He's omnipresent. He's in all places and dimensions simultaneously. He's sustaining my life and your life. He can help me with my sermon, and you can pray to him right now. And he doesn't go, hold on, Garrett's talking. No, he's, he's omnipresent. <laughs> Jeremiah 23, 24 says this, who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do I, I love this, do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord. He's omniscient. God has perfect, complete knowledge of everything. More Vienna sausage water for you. Just think about this. Every textbook, every textbook, not only does he know it, but it's not like he had to read it. Like the truth that is in all science, all history, all literature, that was given by God. Like, God knows it. Not like he studied well, but he, like, he's the embodiment of knowledge. Does that make sense? He is omniscient. He has perfect, complete knowledge of everything. The scriptures always talk about this. There's oftentimes in scriptures, there's a lot of agricultural references because that was the people that were, you know, of that time that, like, God knows how seeds grow. He made that. He caused that. There's, there are good practices and bad practices for agriculture. That's true for every vocation, every part of life. There are things that are true, that if there things that are not, and all of that, all knowledge is mine, declares the Lord. It all comes from Him. God is non-contingent. Next one, that means God is not dependent upon anything else for His existence. Did I read the omniscient verse? I don't think I did. Sorry, let me read you a verse on His omniscience. First John 3, 20, for even our hearts condemn us. God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. Let me read this. Sorry, that just, whew, that's good. It says, and even if in your heart, even your emotions, if even your feelings fail you, which they do a lot, don't they? You wake up angry at yourself. You wake up bitter at someone else, right? It says even when our heart fails, when our heart condemns us, when our feelings just won't shut up, it says God is greater than that. And he knows everything. Love it. Okay, so the non-contingency of God, he is, again, sufficient doesn't need anyone else for his existence. Psalm 93, 2 says this, Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. And then the self-sufficiency of God. God needs nothing outside of himself to maintain his existence. God doesn't get lonely. God doesn't get bored. 
God doesn't go, what do you, you guys got a new PlayStation down there? That's pretty cool. No, he is completely self-sufficient. Let me read this. This is a large section from Psalm 102. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the earth are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will change them like a robe, and they will all pass away, but you are the same, and your years have no end. Let me also talk to you about the sovereignty of God. This is about hierarchy, really, Uh, that God is the supreme being who answers to no one. He is the one and only sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, but He is in control, and He doesn't answer to anyone. Again, He doesn't have to go upstairs to get permission to love you or bless you. No, God is the supreme being who answers to no one. 1 Timothy 6.15 says this, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King and kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Lastly, uh, He is transcendent. Again, we talked about this a little bit, but God is not dependent on or affected by the laws of our universe. Again, time, space, matter, those are things that He created for our universe, but it's not something that He is now dictated by. Does that make sense? All the laws of our universe, no, He's outside of them. He created them. So he doesn't have to bend to them, they bend to him. Exodus 34, 6 says this, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. Transcendent, Psalm 139, 7 through 10. I love this. Where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, there your hand shall lead me, your right hand shall hold me. So now, let's talk about the, where were they? Sorry. I always put things, I'm sure you guys know this, I put things invisibly like on the stage, like I'm like, and God's over here, and now we're over here, and then I have to remind, I don't know, sorry, it's just a weird thing that I do with my brain. Those are the incommunicable attributes of God over there. These are now the communicable attributes of God. You guys look so lost. I'm so sorry. So I want to talk to you about the attributes of God that He calls us to, the things that we want to strive to be. So again, all of these things, I hope all of us go, yes, Yes, I want to be that. Again, their infinite, truest form is the embodiment of our God through Jesus Christ. Let me explain it to you. So, so the first one is just the, the goodness. We all want to be good people, hopefully, right? We already talked about that. True goodness can only be understood through the revelation of God. Again, we all want to be good people. We all want to do our best. But God, we talked about this last week, is the the fullest embodiment of goodness. Remember, he made all the creation and he saw that it was good. That's what God creates. He creates good things. And if we want to be good humans, we must understand the revelation of God. Um, let, let me just keep going. There's so many notes. If you guys are like, I wanted more, you can read the, read the verse because I'm looking at the time. The next thing we've hit, hit already is the justice of God. Again, we all want human justice, and I would say our justice is good, but it is not perfect. That perfect justice can only be found in a holy God through Jesus Christ. God always does what is perfect and right. James 4.12 says it this way, there's only one lawgiver and judge, he who is able to save and to destroy, but who are you to judge your neighbor? Oh, that's good. Thank you, James 4.12, the justice of God. Next, the knowledge of God. Human knowledge is incomplete. True knowledge comes from God. Proverbs the whole book dedicated to this idea, right? The, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise learning or fools despise wisdom and understanding. All of the uh, God calls to you, says, hey, listen, I have knowledge to give you. Next one, love. This is so important. We all want love. We all give love. We all want to experience love. God is love, which means our definition of love comes from the revelation of God. Our culture does it backwards, that this is what I want love to be, so then this is how I want God to be. But if you want to understand perfect, grace-filled love, it's found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. True love. Ephesians 3, 18, 19 says this, May you have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Home stretch here. The mercy of God. 
through the work of Christ, God doesn't give us what we deserve. He is a merciful God. He is a God we saw in the garden. If you eat of the tree, surely you shall die. They did it, and he clothed them, and he promised his son, and he did not kill them. He gave them grace upon grace. Psalm 86.5 says, For you, O Lord, are great and good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love for all who call upon your name. I love this too. Uh, Speech. Our God is a God that speaks to us. Just like you and I talk, he, he speaks. He, he already has self-disclosed so much of who he is through the word of God, the Bible. But he is a God that speaks. Again, he's not a God that's just like, try your best. I'm up here in a mountain in India. I don't know. You know, like just try, hide and seek. Ha ha, try and find me. No, he's like, I, <laughs> I gave you so much. Not only does the Holy Spirit speak to us, but God has spoken to his people through his word. I love this promise in Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Again, the truthfulness of God. We talked about this a lot last week. God is incapable of lying or deceiving. He is the embodiment of of truth, the perfect personification of all we want to know. Like, don't lie to me. Stop sharing things that are fake, right? God's like, all he can give you is the truth, the truth about who he is and the truth about who you are. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says this. Hopefully you've heard this before, but maybe it gives, uh, there's a new shade of his glory in it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. The wisdom of God. God possesses perfect wisdom, always makes the right decisions. Proverbs 2, 6 says this, for the Lord gives wisdom for from his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Okay, I finished. You guys can give yourselves a round of applause. We finished part two of this. Listen to that. Okay, good, good, good. So maybe you feel like me like I've been feeling this whole week. Maybe you're thinking, what the heck, dude? My brain hurts. What does this mean for me? You know? It's like, all right, man, I'm going to go lunch. I got some kids to raise. Can you give me something to live out this week? I'm happy you asked. I want to give this to you. This has always been just a, a cool, I think it's such a poetic opening to a gospel. This is uh, the gospel of John, John 1. I'm going to read to you John 1, basically through 17. But I, I want you to see this because basically all that we've talked about is right here in this verse, which Dustin made the joke like, you could have just read this verse, man, would have been a whole lot shorter sermon. But let me show this to you. So John 1, 1 through 5 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life And the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, we can go to this next slide. Hope you see this. All of the arguments, the argument of first gods, the argument of design, the argument of morality. Remember from the beginning of my sermon? You're like, that was like five days ago, man. What are you talking about? It's all right there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made through Him. Without Him, not anything that was made that was made. And then the morality. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So you don't even need the first part of my sermon. It's all right there. And then let me share this. I'm going to pick it up again in verse 9 of the beginning of the Gospel of John. Stay with me. It says this. The true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made known through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, to his own people, though they did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but the will of God. Don't let me stop you here. So the next one, it says this. You've probably heard this before. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. It says, John bore witness about him, and he cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. And just to quickly summarize, I hope we all have uh, the, 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 the heart of John the Baptist right there, that like he who I'm speaking about, he comes before me, he is greater than me, he is mightier than me. But let me end right here. It says, for from his fullness... We have all received. I want you to to experience that today. For from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth comes through, what's his name? Jesus Christ. So you just stand with me. Stand with me. And and, and praise God. You can do multitask. So here's where I want to end. And the worship team is going to lead us in a song. So proud of you guys for, for getting through this. But I wanted to end here because I want you to know that all of this is not like, hey, you, hopefully you learned some new words today. Go just think about, learn how to spell. You can spell check me. No, but it's, it's all of this, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and that Word came down. The truth of this God that we've talked about today came down. Again, I, I, I want to kind of rest my hat, rest my heart today for all of us to say, All of this that we've talked about, about God, is not just this vague, distant idea, but this God, this omnipresent, all-knowing, immutable, gracious, loving, truthful God dwelt among us. He was here, and he died, and his name is Jesus Christ. Again, the amen, yeah. Say it again. The purpose of all theology is not so that you can feel smarter, (laughs) so that you might experience the power, the presence, the person of Jesus Christ in a brand new way. So I hope we, with everything we've talked about, we just stay right there, that from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Through who? Through Jesus Christ. And maybe today there there was a part and you just went, wow, I've never thought about that before. I've never experienced that before. I, I want you to experience the grace and power of Jesus Christ in a brand new way. So let me just pray over us and then I'll, I'll stop talking, and you guys can all sing together. Let me pray. God, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm so thankful, one, for, for, for a church that's kind of rekindling their love for doctrine and truth. But again, God, keep us, keep us centered, because it's so easy for Christians to, to get smarter, and then they just flaunt it over everyone. I hope we have a posture just like John the Baptist that he just lays down like, I, I, I'm not even fit to carry his sandals. Like, I, 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 I just want to point to the one Jesus Christ so that all of us, I, I pray that we, we would grow on our knowledge and understanding of you, that we would um, be, be swept away in awe and wonder of who you are, that, that hopefully in, in, the, in the weeks and months to come throughout this series, we would we'd be able to dive in more into the Bible, more into the Holy Spirit, more about the, the triune God that we serve, but God, again, I pray all of us would just say, you know what? I want to be the one that puts my faith in Jesus Christ so he can give me the right to become a child of God. And I want to experience not the law of Moses, no, the grace and the truth of Jesus Christ. So, Christ, we look to you. I, I, I just pray that you would draw us closer. You would reveal yourself to us, that it wouldn't be, I learned some theological truth. No, it, it would be, I met the God who made me and loved me and died for me and rose for me to give me the newness of life. So we thank you, Jesus. I pray every topic, every conversation about doctrine and theology would just all always point back to you because you are the purpose of everything. It's all about you, Jesus. So I pray we would worship and we would sing and we would declare more and more of who you are. In your name I pray. Amen.